recording. Okay, excellent. So we'll get started. So hi, everybody, and thank you for joining us tonight. Um, my name is Julie. If you haven't been to one of our events at Roundabout recently, I am the events manager. And we are hoping that live events will come back onto our schedule. But for right now, we're going to continue with these virtual Zoom events. And that's what gives me such great pleasure tonight to welcome G. Elizabeth Kretschmer and her new book, Writing Through the Muck. And she is going to have a conversation with fellow author and roundabout um, eventer, Kay Cox. So I am actually going to uh, turn it over to them right now. We're going to have questions at the end. If this is your first time joining us on Zoom, I will unmute everyone at the end. If you have a question or you're having issues with your audio, please feel free to put it in the chat window. And we are going to go ahead and get started. So I think, Cake, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Julie. Uh, I met G. Elizabeth Kretschmer, or as I know her, Gail. I met her back in the aughts when did did we meet at the nature of words was that where we first got together or somehow we formed a, a writing group and i don't really remember exactly how it happened but uh we were we started meeting we became a group called the ladies of the long table meeting at our friend colleen's house and gail has gone on to be very uh, ambitious and she will tell you that she has a few books out there. Uh, I'm much more desultory as my publicity says. I'm not as ambitious as, as Gail is, but uh, she's, she's done some really lovely work. So Gail, why don't you tell us about some of your books, your other books besides Riding Through the Muck? Thank you, Cake. And while I may have more books published than you, I don't know. Um, your writing is four times more lovely, so <laughs> it balances out in the end. I think Cake and I actually met in the Ladies of the Long Table group. I think the, I think the woman who started it, um, she and I were going to, or getting our MFAs together, and she was starting it, and she said, I know this wonderful author named Cake. Oh. And that's, I think, where it started. Um, so I have mostly been a fiction writer for most of my life with a few bits of nonfiction essay-ish works thrown in there. And so I have two novels and one collection of short stories that I've published um, over the last several years. The first was The Damnable Legacy, which is set primarily in Alaska. And the second was the short story collection Women on the Brink, about women aged 13 to 90, dealing with all sorts of life's unwelcome realities. And then my most recent novel was Bear Medicine, which came out in 2017, and it's set primarily in Yellowstone, and it alternates back and forth between contemporary and historical times. And it revolves largely around women and friendships and how we all need to stick together in these male-dominated times, whether it, we're talking the 1800s or the 2000s. And during the course of all of this writing, um, and going to get an MFA degree, I also began to offer workshops to people, cancer patients, women in domestic violence shelters, and other groups, um, because I knew how good writing felt. I mean, quite, putting it quite frankly, before I started studying the benefits of writing, it was like, writing feels really good. Gee, these people must, um, certainly some other people can appreciate that. And, um, and that's when I started my foray into this other field, which became writing through the muck. So writing through the muck is uh, such a rich mix of genre. It's part memoir, part writer's manual, part self-help. It's a real mix. Where does your vision come from? Yeah, so it was an evolving vision. And I never intended to write, I never intended to write a self-help book because I need as much help as the next guy or more. But as I mentioned, I started offering writing to these workshops and I was actually inspired to do that by the poet Ellen Bass, for those of you who know her. And she has taught workshops, particularly for um, adult survivors of child sexual abuse, but other 
wellness workshops as well. And so my first intention was to make this a writing workshop book to help people learn which tools, first of all, learn some basic writing tools and techniques for people who aren't writers. And secondly, which tools really help you tap into your emotions because that's where writing starts to feel so good is when you get into your emotional space. And so that's kind of where it started. But then I was teaching these writing workshops and I started to um, study on my own what, what's going on here and why is writing so cathartic? Why is writing so therapeutic? Um, like art, like music, writing is another modality that can offer all kinds of therapeutic benefits and there's a tremendous amount of studies to support that. So it kind of started evolving into more of a self-helpy feel in addition to the writing tool, writing workshop feel. But then I kind of got all done with draft number 17 and said, there's still something major missing. And that was me. And it not, wasn't that I wanted to write about me. That was never ever my intention. But I felt like I needed to put my stories in here so that the things I was saying made sense. And I wasn't just some person on a pulpit saying, you should do this and you should do that. So that's when I started working in the stories. And that's when it started being kind of a memoir and kind of a self-help book and kind of a writing workshop book. Yeah, so it's, it's genre fluid. Well, one of the things that Gail and I decided was that I would find illustrations. Um, I tried being inspired to write, but I, didn't, I actually didn't write anything that I wanna share with the public uh, that's new. But, I'm gonna go back to one of my old poems, and this connects up with the idea of memoir and expression of emotion, because it, it deals with, well, I'm an ex-Catholic, so it deals with my sense of, of guilt. This is called Sentence to Venice Yet. For my sins of omission, not bandaging wounds, my wit scratched open, not caring if students chose failure or success, not having faith in the hope of justice, not questioning romance until eruption, not giving all my goods to the poor, not taking up my crossness to follow anyone. And so for all these sins of separation, especially for my sins of discombobulation, grant my penance be walking these 409 bridges telling my beads, hearing knees and spine clicking complaints as I climb over water each day toward heaven. So you've talked to us a little bit about um, what wellness writing is. Uh, you also came up with a bunch of ways of thinking about the self. Um, in your book, and you, you, so you chose some specific ways. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about those 10 ways of thinking about the self? Yes, and first of all, I wanna do a plug for Cake's poetry book from which she just read, and I've got my little flags of some of my favorite poems, and the one she just read, Sentence to Venice Yet, is one of my favorite ones, not only because it's so beautifully written, but because I can relate to the guilt, to the discombobulation, except I don't want to walk 400 and however many bridges. That's not really what I want to do. So um, talking about the self, one of the favorite, my favorite experts that I came along when I was studying why writing is so good for you is actually the psychologist Miller Mayer. And I don't know if you've heard of him, but one of the things he is famous for is, oh, we've got a kitty. Hi, kitty. I've locked my kitty out of the room. One of the things he's famous for is talking about our community of selves. He says that um, we're not just this self or that self, we're a community of selves. And another psychologist, Jerome Bruner, called the complexity of selves an internal clamor of identities. And when I came across some of these writings, I said, that is so me, and it doesn't mean I'm Sybil with multiple dissociated personalities, it just means I have a lot of different selves and so does everybody. And so th the basic ones we often hear people talk about are the physical self, the mental self, the emotional self, and the spiritual self. And those are all, in my opinion, very valid ways to look at ourselves. And 
they're also, it's also important that we look at those, all of those selves when we talk about our, our wellness. We, you know, we think of wellness as being, you know, getting our steps in and eating our kale, but there's so much more to being healthy than that, of course. And then I started looking at um, other kinds of selves. The writer activist Parker J. Palmer talks about how many of us are divided from ourselves when we're little kind of along the same line as the theory of shadow, the shadow self, where we're taught that something we say or do or believe is wrong when we're little or when we're teenagers. And so we shove all those selves aside and we just dis, dis, um, divide ourselves from them. And we spend the rest of our lives seeking happiness and wholeness and partly because we've divided ourselves from ourselves. So I wind up coming up with, um, I don't know, maybe 10 different selves, I don't remember exactly how many, to explore in this book. And it was funny because I think I started out with like six and then I'm like, oh, well, wait, I can't forget the inner child or I can't forget the inner critic. And more and more came along and actually the last self that I added and then I said, I'm going to stop. No matter how many more selves <laughs> present themselves, I have to stop or this book will never get out, was the citizen self. Yeah. And that was after the election in 2016 when myself and so many people in my circle were feeling more frustrated than they ever had been as citizens. And I know many people are still feeling frustrated or again as citizens. So I really felt like the citizen self was a part of ourselves that we need to address when we're thinking about how to, how to be healthy and whole. So that, you know, was kind of a, a long babbly way of saying how I came up with my various selves. And if you haven't opened the book yet, the selves that I do talk about in here are, the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual selves, the holistic self, the inner critic and the inner child, the victim and survivor selves. And I wanna make a point there that to me, the victim self is not the same as playing the victim card. I think we all do, or many of us do have victim selves when bad things happen to us through no fault of our own and it impacts who we are or, or what we believe. And then the, shadow, the citizen self, and then finally, of course, the shadow selves that Jung writes so much about. So Kay, I am sure that somewhere in your array of poetry, you have explored one or more of yourselves. Um, yes, and I, I wanted to actually read a poem in which I explore my urban or my urbis self, myself <laughs> as urbis. Uh, this is called Like You, Venice. Like you, Venice, I once ruled my corner of the earth showing ambassadors of larger powers that I could build and furnish fighting ships in less time than they took to write a letter home. And now I seek no greater later years than yours, filled with tourists, weak with admiration at my ancient spirit, picturesque and ruin, but still working, still living, still enjoying every morsel, even as I slip into the sea. So there I explore uh, my own mortality and uh, ruled my corner of the earth. That was actually about being a teacher and being a facilitator. It's, it's just kind of like my reference to uh, my life. Um, and how I would like to be is, uh, yes, I want, I want people to sometimes admire my poetry. So I guess this is working as part of those, uh, me, it's my ancient paths. So. Um, so my next, my next question for you is you had a number of portals, like uh, portals on a ship or portals to get somewhere through which your readers can explore their experiences. Now, ha and you, that have things like uh, memories and journeys and that sort of thing. How did you pick the particular portals that you picked? That's a really good question. So I'll start by saying the metaphor that came to my mind was being an underwater scuba diver. Well, I guess it's the only kind of scuba diver is underwater. And <laughs> They come, you come across a sunken ship and you look inside through the various portals or windows to see what's going on in the ship. 
but it's dark, it's frightening, it's scary, you don't know what you're gonna find. And when we really open up ourselves and start exploring, it can be equally frightening. So the portals that I decided to use in this book um, evolved organically through the 10 years of workshops that I was teaching to cancer patients, domestic violence survivors, brain injury patients, and various other people. And a couple things. One is I found certain portals to be fairly universal. We all eat food. Most of us come from some kind of home or non-home environment. Most of us dream. So there were some self-oriented portals that I used. And then I got into other portals that had to do with our relationships with others and the roles we, we the masks we wear, the hats we wear out in the world. And I started with kind of more the self-directed portals in part because they were more, they were perhaps more universal. And in part because I wanted to start here and work my way out. And in part, and this is probably the biggest part, is that what I saw in the workshops I taught is that a lot of people wanted to start there. I might have walked in on day one of my workshop and said, let's all write about the day we got our cancer diagnosis. That's not where they wanted to go. They wanted to write about their homes or their families or a journey they wanted to take or a journey they'd been on. And so what I learned is we all, first of all, have to start wherever we want to start for writing, wherever we need to start. But also this was, this was generally safer to start with some of these things. Granted, for some people, home is about as unsafe of a place as you can be. So everything is flexible here, but that was kind of my thought. We'll start inside and work out, start with what might seem safer and work our way into generally speaking, more troublesome areas to explore until we get to the penultimate section, which is really digging through deep muck. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank okay. you, thank you. Okay. I like those because um, as you know, and you held up my book earlier, that was, that was great. I just assumed that most people, since I have- I'll do it three, again. Yes, thank you. That's all about journeys and uh, what I also find very stimulating to me is art. Uh, it's writing ekphrastic poems, poems that are about other works of art, is one way that I can explore some of my own directions. And uh, one of my poems is about a painting called The Presentation of the Virgin in the Temple. I'm going to read that. Uh, under painted stone slab steps nailed over our heads inside the academia, an old woman cloaked in blue and white sits fat and fierce with heavy empty hands, bushel basket on her left, gazing right into the crowd where Venice mimics Nazareth, waiting for someone to fill one upturned open fist with coins for eggs as unaware as we of our own meaning, that she is just a sign of sovereign justice cast in colors of the virgin girl aglow over our heads. Titian's illustrated oath that this city harbored all within its borders, even us. Mm. All right, so um, continuing with your book, on page 204, you write some less than complimentary comments about folks related to you. Uh, this brings to mind the, the responsibility of the writer. Do you think that writers have greater responsibility to other humans or to their personal truth? So, yes. And first of all, for those of you who don't have page 204 open right in front of you, I thought I would just summarize what Cake is referring to. I said, in general, I found that those closer to me are the ones most likely to push buttons. I have a friend who hogs phone conversations and another who frequently cancels our plans to hang out. My adult kids often don't respond to my texts and my husband mansplains. Even my dog Zuzu is guilty of violating my boundaries 
when she walks on my face. None of these are acts of war, but taken together, they conspire to muddle with my state of being, especially on my weaker days. So the answer is yes, I do believe writers have a tremendous responsibility when they write about others. And I've read a number of um, writers talk about this and I just, rather than try to explain what they said, I just wanna mention a couple. One is the, staff, is the poet Kim Stafford who talks about whose brother committed suicide and he writes about that and other parts of his life, but uh, he writes a lot about that in, um, shoot, Cake, what's the name of his book? A Hundred Secrets, okay, I can't remember, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll look it up. Anyway, I love his book, I just can't remember the name. In reflecting about his, his brother's suicide, he talks about the Hawaiian concept of kuleana, and he says certain stories have been given to you along your life path by others, by experience, by hardship, by living in a place, and you are allowed to tell them. But Kuleana also carries the meaning of responsibility. Which stories must you never tell? And for the stories you will tell, how will you tell them? And so he, he really talks a lot about the, import, the responsibility of telling stories. And another quote I loved is by the memoirist, Judith Barrington, who said that people's lives are more important than my words. So, um, in addition to my personal anecdotes in this book, I've also written a couple of essays that have been published as well that have included people, loved ones who are in my life. And it, there's always this fine line of saying, how much do I want to tell because it's important to me to tell this story and how much is fair to reveal to them? And it's a dance and it's a risk and it's a question that we write, writers ask ourselves. And I think when you're wellness writing and the only person who's going to read your journal, you have freedom and you have a responsibility to yourself yeah. to get it all out there. Yeah. Even if you're being melodramatic with yourself, get it all out because that's what you need to do to process. Once you're going to let somebody else read it, yeah. I think you have to really stop and say, am I beyond the place of catharsis? where I'm really now telling a story that, that is going to matter to other people. And also, am I, if I'm writing about a loved one, am I writing from a place of love? Because mm -hmm. if I'm not yet to that point of writing from a place of love, then I can't put it out there. And then the last thing is for me, my process slash agreement that I have with my, in my family, my immediate family is before I put it out there, when I think it's all done, when the publisher is signed off, when I got the contract in hand, but before it goes out, I, let, I have them read it. I ask them to. I say, I'm not asking your permission, but if you do have an objection, I want to talk about it with you, and then we'll decide where to go. And in this particular, you know, in an essay I wrote that was in the New York Times about a heavy metal cruise I went on with my 19-year-old son a few years ago, his only comments had to do with, my use of m dashes and semicolons so it was good um in this book i've made changes um my husband read it the whole thing cover to cover the th my three kids read the portions that were applicable to them and i did make some changes because it just yeah maybe i wasn't telling my entire truth but it was enough of my entire truth to get the point across yeah that's, I, I like what, what you said there, because that's always been, um, that been a challenge for me. I once, um, a couple decades ago, uh, I wrote a novel, and the, the only novel I've ever finished, and um, uh, one of the lead characters was based on a friend of mine, and I, my friend read it and ended the friendship, and it was kind of like, oh, well, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. So, And, you know, it's... Um... What, what I also find interesting, and then I, I want to go back to you on, because I'm assuming you're going to share some poetry with yes. us about this, um, is that what I found with my novels is people would come to me and say, that's me, isn't it? And it wasn't. And then there were people who didn't get that a particular character maybe kind of was sort of based on them. Yeah. So in the end, if it's in fiction, 
if you can get away with a little bit more, yeah. not completely, but more, but when you're writing memoir, then yeah. you really do have that responsibility. Okay, let's True. hear. Well, I have this, this uh, poem that is um, a, about my, my spouse. And it was written about our trip to Venice in 2011. And that was when I was, when I started writing the Venice poems. This is called Mortality. I wake in Venice wondering if you are still alive and listen for your breath. Lift on my elbow and stare hard in meager moonlight. Or is it just the yellow gleam above the nearby court where Sudanese and German youth still toss the ball through ragged chains attached to silvered hoops? Stare at the golden counterpane above your ribs and only close my eyes again after I see your knuckles clutch and sleep and pull its scarlet patterns up across the aging cage that holds our beating heart. Mm. So I love that poem. And I, I mean, I'm right there with you as you are wondering about the breath and the heartbeat. How did this poem make you uncomfortable in terms of writing about Will? What vulnerability of his were you afraid to share? Well, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't believe I mean, he doesn't believe that he's old, you know, and that he was 81 when we were in Venice and he's 90 now. And, and I felt a little uncomfortable about putting in that he's, that he's aged, but he's read the poem and he hasn't complained about it. Uh, I have had experience back in the, in the, early aughts when I was doing a lot more public readings, I remember once uh, asking him about what was it like to hear some of the personal poems that I was writing. And he just said that it's, it's all part of the scene. I mean, he doesn't always like my poems if they're about him or about somebody else, but he says it's all part of the literary scene. So. I think that's that there's a romance to him I think that I'm uh, that I'm a writer I think it's kind of romantic to him so so I think that in those ways I think that errors that I might have made or things that he might have been upset with he because he taught literature he has patience with people who are being writers perhaps more than he'd have with me if I were just standing up saying cranky things, you know, it's uh, <laughs> because you say them so beautifully. Yes. Well, it is a good book. I'm, I'm happy with it. I'm, I'm I may never write another one, but uh, the two I have, I'm actually happy with. So, um, so then we, we get up and I think the, this poem leads very well into the section of your book called digging through deep muck which is uh, where you go into the really hard, the hard stuff, as it were. So why don't you tell us about that section and what did it feel like to share the stories in the context of the book? So it, it was interesting because some of the, um, let me just tell you, for those of you who aren't familiar with the book, what the categories are in digging through deep muck stress in general, transitions, failures, loneliness, discrimination, trauma, mental illness, addiction, physical injury and illness, growing up and growing old, grief and loss, and the final catch-all section of that is dangerous emotions, guilt, shame, fear, anger, and regret. So, I think um, for me, when it, th again, I had written several drafts of this book before I decided to insert myself. And most of those chapters were already in there because they're so universal. Stress in general, show me a person who doesn't know what stress is. Growing up and growing old, physical illness and injury, 
grief and loss, um, transitions. So many of those are just natural parts of lives that we all have or will have gone through. And so they came naturally and they also had been big parts of the writing workshops I had taught as well. But then when I started saying, I need to personalize this book, I needed to start talking about things that I had at least some exposure to either personally or through loved ones. And personally, um, well, transitions was a particularly big one for me because we've moved a lot, many, many more times than I wanted to. And it was really, really hard for me. Um, failure and loneliness, pretty personal stuff, but I've had a lot of, uh, I've had a lot of trouble with those issues over my life and, and also depression, which falls into mental illness, but it kind of ties into failure and loneliness as well. So these were things that I had to figure out how I was going to share. Um, then along came addiction. Uh, and I had had a problem with alcohol for many years. And I also have had experience with addiction with loved ones. Um, so again, personal stories coming up. Um, and then when physical injury and illness came along, I was, I was really getting pretty close to being done with the book when I was diagnosed with cancer. I'm like, great, I have another story to tell now. So um, what, what it really all is about, Cake, is writing, being vulnerable with yourself and then being vulnerable with others. And I talk in my book, when I talk about wellness writing, is how important it is for us to be open and honest with ourselves because if we're not willing to dig into where it really hurts, then we're not being able to gain the catharsis, the self-therapy that we otherwise might. And so in order for me to really share and show people, A, that I'm not just standing on a soapbox telling you to do it, but I'm doing it, but B, that you can survive the pain of that personal archeology. span I just, it, it just became, the more I wrote, the more I felt like I really need to do this. And, you know, the more I did, the less afraid, it, the less frightening it became to share these things that were about me. Yes, I still needed to be very careful about what I was sharing about other people and other loved ones. But this is, you know, this is real life. Life is mucky. Um, and if anything, I wish I could have shared that sounds silly. I wish I could share more personal luck because there's so much other stuff that people are going through that I'm gratefully not going through. I don't have a chapter on homelessness because I personally haven't been homeless. I don't have a chapter on, um, I don't know, various other immigration issues, right? I don't have um, a chapter on poverty because it wasn't a personal experience and I had to write things that I could speak to from some level of honesty in order for me to be genuine. And so, mm -hmm. but the point of what I write in the book and the exercises I offer is that I think they're very transferable. So mm -hmm. you may not have an issue with, or have never known anybody with mental illness, but you may still be able to apply some of the theories I talk about, some of the tools I offer to your homeless experience, et cetera. I like, I like what you have to say about that, about the transferability. And I know that my last year of teaching, I was blogging every day. And most of those blog posts are like, this is what happened in class today. But when I hit February, um, some of the most important stuff for me about February is that it's a month of anniversaries for me. It's it's when my oldest sister went crazy. It's uh, when I was raped. And so I actually wrote about those things in my blog. And it was very helpful for me to get stuff out there. Um, and I think some of that stuff, sometimes sharing it helps other people to, to bring it up for themselves. And I wanted to leave and my part of tonight's program by reading one more uh this is kind of a deep muck um poem 
It's called, But Not Yet, O Venice. I will not see you again until the great grief comes and splits me in as many pieces as count these conjoined years, pieces that may only meld again after I walk and walk and walk your ancient paths, bumble down dead alleys, stumble over marble bridges, blunder onto water buses going out, out to your islands, coming in, in to your cathedrals, losing myself as I will be lost until the hard stone of that future's now softens into then. Mm. That's a heavy poem. It was heavy when I read it in your book and it's heavy listening to you. How, do you, how did you feel when you first got it down and how do you feel now, even now, later reading it out loud? What does, what, talk to us about the emotions there. Well, I hate to say the first emotion is, damn, that's a good poem. Um, that I, because I, I, I like my, I like the uh, music, the word music in it. But in terms of the emotions, and for me, part of what poetry does when I write about deep things like this, um, the actual craft of it is part of what helps me that's the wellness part of it is that because i love words and bumble stumble blunder i mean i love that that part of the poem uh I, the the sounds make me happy even as the content makes me sad and um and i so that's it when i when i read it now I'm really happy with the art uh, when I, and when I wrote it, I felt very sad about it. And yet I was happy with the art. And I think that's part of where the wellness comes in for me is the happiness with the art. Well, I think that ties in with the whole theory behind narrative expression, which is also very similar to music and art and other therapy is that we, even though we're perhaps feeling very, pained about whatever's going on in our lives, we're creating. We're putting ourselves out there in some other form and we're creating and expressing ourselves in a way that we otherwise can't. Because you yeah. can't just walk down the street and into the grocery store before pandemics and just start telling the cashier about your life normally. Sometimes you can get away with that, but well, not normally. In Texas, that, that happens actually, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, in Hawaii too, people talk story a lot in Hawaii, but yeah, we generally don't do that. Not up here in the north, no, we don't, northwest. Yeah. Seattle freeze. So am I, am I able to ask you a question, Kate? Sure, sure. So in my book, I start the book out talking about, fairly early on, about various writing tools and techniques because I really wanted this book to be accessible to people who know how to write and who don't know how to write. Mm -hmm. consider themselves writers or not so you know I have like a three-page summary about poetry which is a joke right you can't really de describe and define poetry in three pages but so be it um, I also talk about fiction I talk about essays I talk about um, you know writing letters and all different ways writing lists all the different uh -huh. ways we can or many of the different ways we can express ourselves you have written a novel you have written other forms and of course you've written poetry you talked a little bit about how poetry allows you to feel the rhythm to feel the art of the words and the expression mm -hmm. um anything else you want to share about why you're drawn to poetry or any of the other forms that have you've been able to use for catharsis um i'm drawn to blogging because it's fast uh i'm drawn to poetry because it's because I love words and it's pretty. Um, I'm, I would like to complete a novel because it's there like a mountain, but I, you know, the, 
I've never gotten one published and I'd like to write a good one. The one I finished was not all that great. Um, well, I'm sorry. That's, so that's, uh, and I used to write a lot of academic stuff and it's, you know, the passive voice is way too natural to me. <laughs> so, um, I'm sorry, I lost track of your question. It was, it was um, what forms you have found most cathartic? Most, most cathartic would be spoken word poetry. Getting up in front of people and rhyming and rap, not rapping, but doing the white version of that. Um, it, because you get the audience connection right away. I think that's m the most cathartic. Do you have a spoken word poem you would like to share with us? Uh, no, I don't. I don't know where my one good spoken word poem is, but it is on the web somewhere. So that's I'm not sure where anymore. But okay, I know I kind of put you on the spot for that. That's yeah. Okay. Um, but I'm feeling I'm feeling pretty complete, Gail. If you want to open it up for questions now. Well, I'm really glad to know you're feeling complete. Um, I don't know if I ever have a day where I feel complete. So kudos to you for that. Um, I just wanted to, first of all, thank you all for coming. And I know Julie's going to open it up for questions. Um, and Lillian, I know you bought the book. No, wait, wait. Diana, you bought the book. Or Lillian, you're nodding your head too. Um, <laughs> you're muted, sorry. So I'm just going to do my shameless promotion. And the reason I'm going to do this, let me do this, is so you recognize it and you can order it through Roundabout, of course, um, and Julie can explain how to go about doing that. And although it is available digitally, I really, really encourage the written book, the, the print book, not only because I want to support Roundabout and independent bookstores, yay, but also because I think this is the kind of book that you want to take your time with and you want to flip back and forth with. It's not just a book you rush through. You want to read it, think about it, practice the the exercises go back and forth. So um, for those of you who have bought it in print, I think that's a wise choice. And of course, then you can support Julie as well. Thank you for that. Yeah, we do have copies in the store. I know we had a cute little display that we put up on social media. And obviously, um, if we are um, out of them, please have us order them. We can usually get m most books in in about two days. Um, and we're still doing porch pickup. So if you're not comfortable coming in the store, we have a little red bench outside and you can um, pick your book up right there. It'll be wrapped with your name on it. But let's go ahead and open it up to questions um, just by show of hands real quick. Do I have anybody who has a specific question and I can unmute you um, specifically? Yep, I, I kind of thought that was coming. So Diana, it's gonna pop up and ask you to unmute on your end. There you go, go ahead. So very interesting tonight um, with both of you. So since I just got it today from Roundabout Books, they mailed it to Colorado to me. Hey. Um, all I've read is when you got muck in your boots and your boys were, <laughs> so I read the first part and I'm like, oh my goodness. And so that really happened? Oh yeah, that really happened. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So. Do I need to start like at page 11 and read through, or is it the type of book you can say, I'm feeling aggression today, so can I read about that? Yeah, either way. Okay. It, there is an intentional flow, or an, yeah, there, an intended flow, and certainly the opening parts about what is wellness writing, if you have any doubts about that, I'd encourage you to read that. If you want to explore just some various tools and techniques to dust off the old writing machine inside you that's a good place to also read at the beginning but if you don't feel like you need that and you're ready to start writing about stress you can jump right ahead to page 300 or whatever that's on and go to it and you can absolutely jump back and forth yeah i'm not a writer not much of a writer um academic types of technical things but i'm looking at this book to for just the personal feelings and getting my feelings out and so that's why I'm really looking at it. I don't know that I will write. So I will probably skip the, the tips to write and go straight to the meat of it. I think that's great. And I think, well, first of all, I do like to say that pretty much everybody is a writer. If you write emails or you write 
Christmas right. letter, or whatever. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> um, I even have a section here, a tool called writing lists, right? Which Nora Ephron yeah, did. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. you can write um, however you want. And of course, if you don't want to write, you just want to do it to process feelings. That works well as, as that works as well. The other thing I think that is kind of cool about the way I structured this book is that you can, if you know somebody who's going through a mental illness issue, let's say, they don't necessarily want to read the whole book, but you can just say, you know, I don't know copy, you know, I don't care about copyright, copy the three pages having to do with mental illness and say, hey, I wonder if this might help you, whatever. So sometimes in reading this, you'll think of someone else you know who might benefit or it might even just prompt you with some things to say to them, even if you never mentioned the book. Right. So yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, Julie, I have a question for you. Yeah. Do you have any copies of my book left? I want to say yes. I am have not been in the store recently because of everything that's going on. Right, right. Um, but we can definitely... I have extra copies yeah. because when I was planning to go out on tour, I bought a box full and now that's not happening. So uh, <laughs> be happy to bring some to you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, it's the same with any of our local authors. If someone comes in and requests them, we absolutely will contact the author to get it. So okay. um, let me send an email to Sarah and we'll make sure that we have at least a couple of copies uh, on in that section of yours as well um right yeah that'd be that's awesome i mean i know that we've sold at least a couple so well i don't i don't i really think i think all my friends have copies and right. my parents are dead so you know who else is gonna buy it so <laughs> <laughs> that'd be great <laughs> all right do we have any other questions Julie, I, Julie, I assume you, you have some copies of Gail's book, because I'll be there tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely. We should. Okay. Um, they cool. just put a post up. I think it was either today or yesterday, and I think we still had two or three copies. Okay, good. Yeah. I'll, yeah. yeah. Excellent. So, I'm looking forward. Thank you. Yay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. All right. Am I on? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So if I would hint for the poetry book for I live in uh, Iowa. Do you, you do ship to other places? Is that right? Roundabout books will ship? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can either, I believe you can either do it over the phone or you can actually do it through our website and we'll still ship it straight from the store. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And I have the writing through the muck already. Um, so, and, and I've, read, I've read the whole book and I, I really learned a lot in that beginning part in, in answer to your questions. Um, Diana, is it? Yeah. That first part has got so much information about writing. Um, but the part that I really loved was when I get into the rest, got into the rest of the book. Um, so I think you're really going to enjoy that. So, and um, the po your poetry, I loved your poetry tonight. Um, oh, I'm you. more of a photography painter kind of person, but I like the way you take your words and paint a picture with your words and um, with a sense of place and emotion and uh, how you capture special moments and, um, and that you. readers can identify with. So I would like to get a copy of your book. And I, I, also, I also enjoyed your cat going by. <laughs> Your what? My, what? Stacy's cat going by. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think when you read Cake's poems and you see the words on paper, you will even more so have an appreciation for the way she paints the pictures. Yeah. Although she reads them beautifully, of course. Yeah. All right. Anything else? For the good of the order, as, as I used to say in meetings. I just want to thank everybody for coming. This has really been wonderful. And like cake, I was going to go on a book tour. And we were going to do this in person. Yeah. And I was really looking forward to coming to Bend because I lived yeah. there for 10 years and I loved it and still love it. Um, 
and I have boxes and books too because the tour never happened. Yeah. So it's really great when we do this. Well, I definitely want to have you both in the store once we can have uh, live events again. So I will keep everyone posted. And um, Gail, if you're not familiar but maybe are interested, um, the Central Oregon Writers Guild, I think you might be a really great guest speaker for them. Um, Oh, thank you. you look into you should, yeah. Remember, great idea. The publicity director. And I think this would be a great book to present about. So thank you. I will. Yeah, get, yeah that's a great idea. Yeah. That's a great yeah. idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, did we have any any last questions, Stacy? I what don't. I really. I'm, I want to thank you both. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Stacy. Yeah. What are you drinking? Um, a, a gin and tonic. Oh, nice. <laughs> I was wondering that too. <laughs> sorry, I am sorry. It is Friday. It is Friday. <laughs> it's after six o'clock, so it's cold. After six o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> so for anyone looking to order um, from Roundabout, our website is roundaboutbookshop.com. Um, we are also on bookshop.org, and mm -hmm. our phone number is 541 306 5654. No, 6564. 541 306 6564. I do have it memorized. Yeah. Um, I appreciate everyone who made it here tonight. We have all had so many Zoom requests, I'm sure, just the same as so many live events in, in just months past. So I really appreciate everyone taking the time to support our authors and our bookstore. And hopefully we will see your shining faces either on Zoom or in person very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Everybody, yeah. have a good weekend. Bye -bye. Out of the month. Bye. Yeah. Good to see you all. Bye. 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 Bye.